Hey guys, it's Thursday right now and this video is coming out tomorrow on Friday. I always upload my YouTube videos if I can on Fridays and I never film a video clip the day before a video is going live. But in this case, I have this 30 plus minute video that I was about to release tomorrow and I realized that it's a health related video sharing a lot of updates, but it just is not up to date because every day over the past few weeks, there's been more and more information coming out and I've gotten more information from medical experts and doctors. So I just wanna warn you that what you're gonna see in this video is sort of vlog ramblings along the way as things were unfolding. Just to sort of orient you as to what you're gonna hear in this video, the first half is all about some cardiology things I've been dealing with lately. And I recorded this whole clip of what happened, what the cardiologist said, what my final takeaway was, and the syndrome that they told me I have. But I just want to make sure that you keep watching because towards the end of that clip, I'm gonna pop back in looking like this and I'm gonna give you the latest update because there have been some more updates since then. And then the next half of this video is gonna focus on the CGM or the continuous glucose monitor that I wore on my arm for a couple weeks. I was tracking my blood sugar and I do a whole CGM Q&A at the very end of the video, so stay tuned for that. Warning you, this is gonna be a long one. I think this video is over 30 minutes. So just get comfortable, do some laundry, relax, pop me in like a podcast, do whatever you gotta do. I'm just happy you're here for the ride. I wanted to provide all of you with a little bit of a health update for me. I was honestly considering not sharing this information because I don't really have total and complete answers yet, but how I work with YouTube, how I've always worked, I just share it with you guys in the moment as I'm going through something. Honestly, it's a little cathartic for me to talk through the process and process it as it's happening. So even though I don't quite have answers, I've decided to not hold off. I'm just gonna share with you guys what's happening and what I know so far. Just to backtrack, I have recently taken a couple of blood tests that test for these like genetic markers that can tell you what your genetic risk is of having a cardiovascular event in your lifetime, whether that's like a heart attack, heart disease, stroke. I have some family history of heart disease and I took that blood work recently and my genetic risk number came back very high. When I first saw that number on a blood test, I of course said to a doctor, what can I do to bring this down? Are there lifestyle factors I can change? Is there like dietary things I can avoid? What can I do to bring this down? And they were very clear with me that this number, which I'll pop up what was being tested, this number is not a number that you can really change in your life with lifestyle changes. This is a genetic marker of your risk. So of course I see that number and that sends up a little bit of a red flag for me. Now we can kind of fast forward to a couple of months ago, I start having a pain right here. Now I know that the cameras may be flipped, but this is my left side. So this is right where my heart is. And it was a very on and off pain. Every so often I would feel like a dull tightening sensation. I don't know where exactly it was coming from. Sometimes I would feel it high up, sometimes low down. Actually, sometimes I was feeling it in my back. The fact that I felt it in my back and that I almost felt like I wanted to massage the muscle made me feel like maybe this whole thing is not heart related. Maybe it's just like musculoskeletal. And that's really what I was hoping for. I was definitely feeling something that wasn't right. And I ignored it for a decent amount of time. For probably a month, I just felt it and was like, it's fine. More so, I was actually scared to go see a doctor because especially after this blood work I got, I just had up in my head that like something was going on with my heart and I had this high genetic risk and I honestly just didn't wanna know what was going on. But after a month of this pain, I was like, this is a stupid plan. You have to go see a cardiologist and at least see what's happening, get some confirmation that you're okay. So I went into the cardiologist they did an EKG and an echocardiogram. My understanding is that an EKG looks at the heart's electricity and the echocardiogram looks at the structure of the heart. Thankfully, my echocardiogram was normal. He said structurally everything looked good. I didn't seem to have any fluid around the heart. They didn't identify any blockages. The EKG, however, the cardiologist noticed that I had some kind of a weird abnormal EKG. He made it clear that he didn't feel like it was an emergency finding, but that it was abnormal and that he wanted to follow up on it by having me wear a Holter heart monitor, which is one of those monitors that you take home with you. Sometimes you need to wear it for 24 hours, sometimes a full week. He had me wear it for four days. I had to wear it day and night as I slept. The only time I took it off was in the shower. This is actually the photo I posted on my Instagram. This is like the only thing I've shared with social media so far about this is that I wore this monitor. A week after I returned the monitor, I had to come back in to give them blood work. And then as soon as I 
I did that, I had to come back in a week later to do a stress test. Stress test is like when you come in and you run on the treadmill and you're hooked up to an EKG and then they like do an ultrasound of your heart before and after you run and they kind of see how your heart responds to the stress of running. So when I went back in for this stress test, unfortunately my original doctor that I had seen before who evaluated my EKG, he wasn't there, he was out sick. So I ended up seeing two other doctors. They, you know, looked at my blood work, they looked at my stress test, and they came into the room and they told me everything looks normal, everything's good. And I was just so relieved. I mean, I didn't know what I expected them to say, but they basically told me you passed your stress test, everything looks normal, your blood work came back, there was no inflammation around the heart, everything seems pretty good. I mean, the only thing they told me was that I do have this high genetic risk of cardiovascular problems. So once I turn 40, they might want to evaluate me more regularly. And I left, you know, called all my family and friends and was like, my heart is perfect, everything's fine, nothing's weird. And I was just so happy. And they actually told me that the pain I was feeling here was most likely not related to my heart at all because there were no problems. So they said it's probably like stress and anxiety related pain and that it shouldn't be a problem. So I walked away from that, I was feeling good. Next thing you know, two days ago, I stopped into anthropology. I was doing a little shopping around for Mother's Day. And what do you know, my phone rings and it says it's the cardiologist's office and it's the original cardiologist that I saw who was sick the day I came back for the stress test. And I thought he was just calling to follow up and be like, you know, I'm sorry I was out, but you got all your answers from the other doctors. But no, he was calling to tell me that he evaluated everything after the fact and he looked back at my EKGs that I took and at my Holter monitor and he thinks that I have something called WPW. I'll pop up a little blurb about it here. I had never heard of this but apparently this is a syndrome that you were born with. And it basically is about the electricity of the heart and my understanding of it is that electricity runs to everyone's heart through a certain channel. And if you have WPW, then it's possible that you have accessory pathways that run electricity to your heart. If you're a medical doctor and I got that wrong, please explain it to me in easier terms below. But my understanding is that I could have this hidden accessory pathway that is sending electricity to my heart, which I guess could have been the cause of what he was seeing on my EKG. He told me that my EKG did not look like the textbook definition of someone with WPW, like I did not meet all the criteria, but I met some of them. And he said that he shared my scan with another heart electricity doctor at NYU who agreed that it looks like WPW. So of course I'm standing in anthropology very confused and just very much like, wait, what? I just left the doctor two days ago. They told me that I was fine. And now you're calling me and telling me that I have this thing. I don't actually think that this syndrome is necessarily a huge deal, but of course to be given like a label and problem that your heart has is a little scary. He still also did tell me that WPW is not really associated with pain. So he still thinks that the pain is like stress or anxiety related, which is a little ironic because now that you're calling me and telling me that my heart has an electrical abnormality, naturally my stress and anxiety is going to go up. So the pain has not yet subsided, but that's kind of where we're at right now. He told me that he wants me to go do a follow-up appointment with this other doctor to confirm if he really does think it's WPW, he said that I might have to wear another monitor, I might have to do another stress test, I might have to get some more blood work. So it's kind of just opened up a little door of a lot of question marks that are flying out the door. That's sort of where we're at right now. To be honest, I'm not that concerned about this potential diagnosis. I'm not like scared about it, I'm not stressed about it. I just am feeling and what I really wanted to open up to YouTube about is that I'm just feeling a bit of, what's the word? Discouraged. I'm feeling discouraged. And there's a few reasons for this. I mean, first and foremost, I like to think of myself as a person that cares deeply about my own health. I feel like I do all the best things I possibly can from a lifestyle perspective, from a diet perspective, from a stress management perspective. I feel like I'm pretty good at taking good care of my body. I really prioritize sleep. I meal prep my food and try to eat healthy whole foods as much as I can. I have celiac disease, so I naturally already can't eat a lot of junky, junky food because there's gluten in almost everything 
everything. So I have like a generally really healthy diet and it is just a little discouraging that a person like that who barely drinks alcohol has never done any drugs in my life. The fact that I would have a health problem feels like discouraging to me. I know that a lot of things are genetic. I know a lot of things are not necessarily related to lifestyle, but I do like to think that we can take control of our health in various ways. And over the past few years, like it's kind of been disproven to me. <laughs> and what I mean by the past few years is I now feel like I've had three instances in my life of going into a doctor to get something minor checked out and then leaving being told that I have something kind of major. The first example was I had a pain under my rib cage, went into the doctor, was told I had gallstones, taken into surgery, and had my gallbladder taken out. The second was when I had a series of migraines and I had blood work done and was told that I had an autoimmune disorder, celiac disease, and had to completely adjust my whole lifestyle for that. And now I have a slight pain in my chest, which leads me to an EKG, which tells me that I have this electrical abnormality in my heart. I get that like in general with the human body when you go looking for things you sometimes might find things but I really don't think in any of these three cases I was out there just hunting for problems when there weren't problems. I think in all three of these cases, I had an issue that needed addressing and it led me to an answer that unfortunately wound up being a problem. So far, that's been very discouraging to me is that I just feel like there are a number of health problems that I do not have control over and I don't like feeling like things are out of my control. I generally don't feel like I have like a control desire, but it does feel discouraging when you do all these lifestyle things to try to remain healthy and then health issues still arise. So that's where I'm at right this moment with the heart stuff. I'm gonna keep you guys updated. I've just decided to be an open book throughout the process and tell you what's happening. But yeah, that's that. I'm popping back in here in real time because I have further updates for you regarding my heart. And I'm pleased to say that the updates are very positive. I did that follow-up appointment that I told you about with the new cardiologist yesterday and I was in his office for about an hour and a half. He had me do some more EKGs. In the EKGs, he was having me like bear down and put pressure on myself. In a couple of them, he was trying to stimulate my nervous system by rubbing on my neck in different spots. Honestly, I felt like it was actually a very interesting doctor visit because I could see this cardiologist looking at me like a case that he wanted to crack. He had a few EKGs from the other cardiologist. He did his own EKGs. He had the results of my four day Holter heart monitor. He had my stress test results. He had my blood work and he was kind of putting all the pieces together and looking at it holistically to try to rule certain things out and figure out what I actually have going on here. I think my final takeaway from this meeting with him is that I do not have WPW and he was trying to figure out what I have because I definitely have something. There's definitely some electrical abnormality, but he was able to rule out WPW. So after a bunch of tests, he sort of lit up and I think he was really excited that he seems to have cracked the case. And he told me that what I have is called a nodoventricular pathway. What I was told is that what I have in particular is extremely extremely rare, but not at all dangerous. He basically told me that this is what is accounting for my abnormal EKGs, but it's not something that I need to worry about, and it's not something that is actually related to the pain that I'm experiencing. I just wanna quickly circle back to the last clip where I was talking about how disheartened I am, no pun intended, how discouraged I was feeling with all this medical stuff. I don't know if you guys remember way back when, when I was getting migraines before I was told that I had celiac disease, I did an MRI of my brain Brain and I was told that I was missing one of my transverse sinuses. It's basically like a big vein in your brain that on my scan it looks like I just did not have it on one side. <laughs> Turns out I have it, it's just a little smaller on one side and it was a little hard to see on the scan, but it is a developmental abnormality that is fine and was not the cause of my migraines, but it was just a random finding that we found because we did a brain scan. And this is kind of a similar thing. I went in to see a cardiologist because of chest pain, got an EKG, and I had another incident finding that I have this developmental heart abnormality that's not dangerous but is something that's causing abnormal results on the scan and at this point you know I've kind of come to peace it's easy to say now in hindsight now that I know that everything's okay but I've kind of come to peace with the fact that things are gonna not always be perfect the body is not a perfect place you know a lot of people are born with developmental abnormalities and when you start doing scans you will find things that seem scary because they're not normal 
but they're also not a problem. And I'm just apparently a person who has a bunch of known abnormalities. My brain, my heart, who knows what else about me is abnormal, but I'm just gonna look at it in a positive light from here on out. As long as I'm healthy, I'm happy to be abnormal. I'm happy that there's something about me that sets me apart from the rest. I really did have a change of heart in this, oh, no pun intended. I really did just have a, a shifted mindset throughout this process as I came to peace with this thing that I might have that might be scary, this health anxiety that I carry with me really diminished a lot throughout this process as I sort of gave up control and realized that I'm gonna have things like this in my life and I just need to face them head on as they come and not let them affect my mental state. So right now, currently, the day before this video goes live, I'm in a pretty good mental state and I just wanted to pop in with this interlude. All right, back to the video. Time for coffee. We are finally entering a stage where, in New York at least, it's starting to warm up. It's starting to be bright and sunny in the mornings. Our window right here, that is the kitchen window, I'll show you. This window faces east, so this is where we get our morning sun exposure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all clean. This window faces east, so this is where we get all of our morning sun. And it's now, what is it, almost 10.30, so it's not quite as harsh anymore, but at like seven to nine, the light in here is just fabulous. It's like blasting the whole stove area. And honestly, the winter is cloudier, so it's not always as bright and sunny, and I can always tell that spring is coming because it starts to get so bright in here in the morning, and it's also like just the air. The air is changing. Another thing that's really great about our apartment is that it faces the courtyard of the building we're in, and between this building and the one behind it, there is a tree, like a really big tree that has blossoms. And so in the summer, it's all green, and when you look out your window, right where I am in the kitchen, you just see greenery. And in the winter even, you could just see the branches. Now it's spring, and so it's just starting to blossom into like little buds. And I'm gonna try to turn this around and show you. I don't know if you can see out the window. Let's go closer, hold on. I hope you can see. But it's just starting to blossom. Like look right here. Ooh, pretty. One big change that we've made in this apartment recently that I want to show you is right here. Do you see this big empty space right here? This area used to be where we kept that giant playpen of Milo's and we basically assembled it the moment he started crawling and it was like this safe haven spot that we could put him if we were in the kitchen cooking and we needed him to sit somewhere. We had a lot of toys in there with him. And then the owner of this apartment who we're renting from is actually looking to sell the apartment. And because of that, they needed to send a photographer around to take photos. And I was like, Michael, we can't have a photographer taking photos with this ginormous thing clogging up the whole living room space. And honestly, even though it was useful with Milo over the past six to seven months, it was also a huge imposition in our space. Anytime we wanted to get around it, it was like we were sneaking past corners. And by the end of it, Milo didn't even really like being inside of it. He was just holding onto the edge, like leaning over the top saying, mama, mama, da, 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 and he wanted to get out. So we realized it's time to remove it. And now we are just kind of letting him roam free. The space Space is pretty baby proofed. We lost the playpen and it feels so nice. It's so bright and airy in here. I'm just enjoying my morning coffee in the sunniest spot of our apartment right now. I just wanted to chat a little bit because this is our last three months of living in New York City forever before we move. I personally love New York City once it starts to get warmer outside and it's just the summer vibes in the city are immaculate. So, you know, I think it would have been easier to move out in the middle of winter. In this time of year, I'm a little sad about it, but we have so much excitement happening. We are designing this house. We're doing a lot of renovations and work on the house. And so I'm trying to like go to the house as much as I can to film footage of what's happening and show you the changes. I will obviously be doing a full before and after type reveal video, but I have been wanting to kind of capture the moments in between. I just gotta say, designing a house is a lot of work. It's fun work, I love it. I've said to Michael many times, I think I wanna quit my job and become a designer because I'm loving it. And we are working with an interior designer who is carrying most of the weight. I actually built an 
intense uh, Notion template for these renovations. I'm not gonna dive too far into it, but it's it's basically got all the different rooms that we're planning on doing and then inside each room there's like a little bit of information about what we're doing and the cost of it so I can track everything. I did put every room on the Notion template however there's not an exorbitant amount of work happening in every room but there is something happening in every space and I think I'm gonna do like I don't know maybe I'll do another video that's just how we ended up picking a house and then how I'm going about mood boarding and designing. I don't know if you guys would be interested in that let me know but it is really very exciting stuff and and I personally love moving. I love change. I love rearranging and redesigning spaces. So this is like prime time for me. One quick other thing that I just wanted to show you on my phone while I have it here. This app that I got and this monitor that I put on me that is a continuous glucose monitor. I will link for you down in the description box and pop up a photo right here of the brand that I bought. I got it from an online supplier, so I will put the link for you below. I've been sharing a little bit about this on my Instagram stories, but I do just wanna talk about it here and share a little bit about what I'm learning. However, I'm only a few days in, so I have not learned much. This is called a continuous glucose monitor. For people who don't understand what the point of it is or what it is, it's basically like a little prick that is pricked into me. Applying it did not hurt at all. You just push a little applicator and it goes in. I didn't even feel a pinch at all, but there is like a little needle in there that is able to get access to my blood. And anytime I want to, I can take my app that's connected to the monitor. I can go to it and press scan. Let me just show you it focusing scan and then I can hold it right here just like Apple Pay and it will tell me my glucose level. So I'm not like a huge expert in this area but I do understand the basics which is when you ingest glucose in any way which doesn't need to be you eating pure sugar it could be you eating things that your body then breaks down into glucose your blood sugar levels will go up and then your body will create insulin to bring the levels down people that have different types of diabetes have difficulty producing insulin which is why they're often giving themselves insulin injections to bring their blood sugar levels down or they're ingesting glucose tablets to bring their blood sugar levels up if you have diabetes and I'm saying this incorrectly I apologize and I would love a more detailed explanation <laughs> below but that's my understanding of it. My best friend Lauren actually has type 1 diabetes, so she's explained this to me a few times. And I know type 1 and type 2 are very different. The reason I'm wearing this is threefold. Number one is that I am just really curious about my body's blood glucose levels throughout the day and how they change based on the things I'm eating, the exercises I'm doing or not doing, etc. Two is because I took a recent blood test and my levels, my blood glucose levels, fell somewhat on the lower end of the pre-diabetic range and so there's a part of me that was curious I don't know am I a pre-diabetic do I need to change anything to avoid becoming a diabetic I hope I'm saying this all right that's a reminder for me that I have a meeting in 20 minutes. And three is that my grandfather actually had type one diabetes and I'm not sure how genetic it is or isn't. I've also heard from people that celiac disease and type one diabetes have shown to have a connection and I have celiac disease. So long story short, I ordered this online. I paid for it out of pocket. It's not covered by insurance if you don't have diabetes and it's a 14 day sensor. So I put it on and now anytime I want throughout the day, I can scan it. I don't need to scan it a million times though because it's a continuous monitor so anytime I scan it will show me the chart for the time period that I missed basically I've just been eating my normal diet experimenting with maybe eating things that I maybe wouldn't have eaten just to see how that affects my blood sugar level and then seeing if changing various aspects of what I'm eating or how I'm moving my body after I eat affect the spike. I am under the impression that with blood sugar levels, what the goal is, is to have kind of like stable and steady blood sugar in the normal healthy range throughout the day and to not have those like peaks and valleys where it spikes up. And just to give you an example, like I started following this account on Instagram that a lot of you told me about, which is called the glucose goddess. She shares a bunch of charts that show, just an example, if you eat a slice of pizza, this might be what happens to your blood sugar level. However, if you have a salad or some sort of vegetable before you eat the pizza, then your blood sugar level will spike 
way less, which I believe is healthier for you overall. And I think the thing that I'm learning is that blood sugar levels are not only relevant to people that have diabetes, blood sugar is actually a major factor that affects almost everyone's fatigue levels, mood, mental health, physical health in a lot of ways. So I wanna point out that it's such an immense privilege as a person who is not a diabetic to be able to get one of these. I know a lot of diabetics can't get access to these and they need them. So I'm calling that out, that it is very much a privilege. However, I do find that there is value in the average person understanding what's happening inside of their body as well. I'm gonna just scan it again. Right now my glucose is 107. You can see like over the past, I guess that was like 3 a.m. to now, which is 10.40 a.m. My levels have been pretty even. There was a point in here, I put a little note in right around here. Sorry, this footage is weird. There was a note right around here where I ate breakfast and you could see that my breakfast did not spike my levels at all. I have been focusing on trying to have breakfasts that have a nice balance of carbs, protein, and fat. And I've also been focusing on trying to have savory breakfasts where possible because my whole childhood was about sweet breakfasts, like basically dessert for breakfast. And so now I'm just heading more towards the savory breakfast world. Things like toast with hummus and avocado and red onion or eggs with onion and peppers, jalapenos and sauerkraut. I don't know if that is attractive as a breakfast to the average person, but I think that the glucose goddess recommends a savory breakfast as a number one way to control blood sugar levels throughout the day. I'm very intrigued by this. Can't say I've learned too much just yet because it's only been in for three days, but I can keep you posted if you guys are interested in learning more about this. And I'll definitely link the monitor for you down below. I've got a Lucy Fink Media team call happening in 15 minutes so I'm gonna get set up right here at my computer start doing some work and I'll keep you posted on house stuff and talk soon It's Q&A time. My continuous glucose monitor is off. I took it off about two weeks ago. I feel like I got a lot of knowledge when I had it on, and I do feel like I was able to identify some factors that helped when it came to reducing that blood sugar spike. I hope that by answering all the questions you submitted, that, that sort of gives you a full picture view of all my takeaways here. So the question is, was this your idea or was this your doctor's idea to try this? And the answer is, it was my idea. I was told by that initial doctor that my A1C level, as I mentioned, was in the pre-diabetic range. I was told that my fasting glucose level was slightly high, and they told me that technically I would be classified as someone who has pre-diabetes, but they never said that I should put this on. They never gave me a prescription for it. This is just something that I've heard a lot of health and wellness people mentioning that they've used it at various times in their lives, and it was something that I was interested in trying, and I figured, especially having been given that information from the doctor, that this would be a good thing for me to try. Next, did you go through insurance or did you buy this out of pocket? I bought this out of pocket. I will once again link for you the supplier that I got it from below, but I think I paid about $100 to $120 to buy this out of pocket, so I did not need a prescription. I didn't need to set up my insurance. Did it hurt to put on? No, and I mentioned that in the previous clip. It really did not, and I was afraid that it was going to. I was holding the applicator over my skin and made my friend count to 10 before I pushed it, but when I pushed it, it was almost like I wasn't even convinced it went in because I did not feel anything. Do you have a history of diabetes in your family? Yes, my maternal grandfather had type one diabetes, which is the only diabetes that I know about in my family. Are continuous glucose monitors predominantly for diabetic individuals, or is it okay for those who don't have diabetes to try it out. I think this one is a personal question. I, I definitely feel like there are going to be people out there who would say, this is a diabetic tool. If you're not diabetic, then you shouldn't be ordering this. As I mentioned in the previous clip, what a privilege to be able to get your hands on this if you don't have diabetes. So I do understand that whole thought process. However, the research I've done over the past few weeks has definitely led my thoughts more towards the category of blood sugar levels are important for everybody and that whether or not you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes or no diabetes at all, managing your blood sugar levels throughout the day can have major effects on you physically and mentally. So my personal belief is that this is a really great tool for anyone with or without diabetes. Something that's really interesting with the continuous glucose monitor is that what spikes my blood sugar might not spike yours. So really every body is individual and unique and you won't know how your body reacts to different things until you are wearing a monitor like this.
this. Does it increase your chances of gestational diabetes for a future pregnancy? This is a question that I don't know the answer to. I went through my first pregnancy with no gestational diabetes and now I'm finding out this information. So I was, I was told I did not have gestational diabetes by my OB and now my doctor obviously told me that my levels were in the pre-diabetes range. So I don't know if things just changed or if it's unrelated, but I, I don't think that it necessarily affects gestational diabetes. What was your most enlightening part of this experience? So I'm gonna use this question just to sort of dive into all the stuff that I learned about my body throughout this process. I know a lot of people use a continuous glucose monitor and then walk away really understanding which specific foods spike their blood glucose the most. And for me, that is white rice. I would not have thought that white rice would caused my blood sugar to go as high as it did. I think the first time that my blood sugar spiked with it, my dinner was like broccoli with chicken and white rice. And I think the next night, I tried to add on a fat because the first one just had like protein and a vegetable. So the next night I tried to add on some avocado and some flax seeds to it and it did help a little bit. But white rice, for some reason for me, it just causes an insane blood sugar spike. Actually even more so of a spike than an acai bowl caused me. When I had that acai bowl, I was very cautious about pairing it with a lot of healthy fats. So I went to order this acai bowl and I got peanut butter and I got flax seeds and I wanted to make sure that I was kind of counterbalancing the sweetness and the sugars with protein and fat. So I also had the mixed protein powder into it and it really did not spike my blood sugar as much as I thought it would. The other thing is I tend to have a few gluten-free cookies cookies at night as my dessert. And on the first night I had those cookies before bed and it spiked my blood sugar a little bit because they're not the sweetest cookies in the world, but it definitely spiked it a little bit. The second night I had the same cookies at the same time, but I put flax seeds on the plate and I was like coating the cookies in flax seeds before I ate them. And the blood sugar spike was not nearly as big. So that was definitely a big takeaway I learned from the glucose goddess and some other blood sugar accounts. It's not necessarily about taking things out of your diet that spike your blood sugar, but it's about kind of figuring out what to eat with them or what order to eat them in to reduce the spike. So, you know, I'm of course not gonna cut out those cookies, but I am gonna add the flax seeds with them, especially if I'm having them that late at night. That's another thing to talk about is the time of night when I'm eating, because one thing I did notice is that there were a few times, you know, we put Milo to bed around 7.30, and then sometimes Michael and I don't have our dinner until 8.30, and you know, on occasion, that can get pushed to like 9 p.m., which is really, really late. What I noticed on my chart was that any night that Michael and I had dinner in the 8.30 to 9 range, and then we would go to bed, you know, sometime between 10 and 11, my blood sugar levels in the morning were higher than they probably should be. And then on the nights when I had an early dinner and I went to bed at a decent time, my blood sugar seemed to be more regulated overnight and a little bit lower. And that's another number that I was looking into was what my fasted, blood glucose levels were first thing in the morning. If you don't have diabetes, that number should be under 100 first thing in the morning or under 99 or something first thing in the morning. For me, which was kind of another indicator of like potentially pre-diabetes, is that that number for me first thing in the morning was pretty much always like 99, sometimes 101. I know it's important for me to kind of eat my dinners and eat my meals and dessert if I'm gonna have any earlier in the night and then sleep and then I have a better chance of waking up with more stable blood sugar. Do you feel it when you're wearing it and does it hurt sleeping on the side? You absolutely don't feel it when it's on. There were so many times I forgot it was there. You can sleep on it, you can push on it. It really doesn't hurt. The one thing I will say is that there were like two or three times when I went to pull my bra off and like my bra strap got hooked on it and I pulled it and it didn't hurt. It wasn't like, ow, the needle hurts. It's more so that like it kind of made me cringe just thinking about like tugging on this thing that was sticking into me. Um, and then also like the stickiness around it that's holding it in place is very, very sticky. So honestly, like any pain I felt when I was snapping the bra was probably from like the stickiness pulling away from my skin because it definitely was very sticky. Stays on in the shower for two weeks. That's how sticky it is. That was probably the only thing that ever hurt me, but the monitor itself, no pain. Science versus pod said that prediabetes was coined by pharma companies and not doctors. 
thoughts. This is very interesting because I didn't know this, but I do think it's an interesting thing to think about that sometimes pharmaceutical companies can like come up with names for things so that you buy drugs or feel like you need to go see a doctor and do things. So it's just very interesting for me to keep in mind that it's not necessarily a condition like I don't actually have diabetes at this point in time so I don't need to treat myself in any way. Were your levels also abnormal on regular fasting glucose tests? Yes. The reason that I took this test was because on regular fasting glucose tests my A1C level was slightly high in the pre-diabetic range and my fasted glucose levels were slightly elevated as well. Did I ever double check the levels with an actual finger prick because continuous glucose monitor levels can be off? No, I didn't do that. I do think if I ever do this again in the future, I might try a different brand. I might try the finger pricks to see if it can be more accurate. For now, I felt like that was as good as it was gonna get. It was just my first time testing it out, so I was fine with it. Did you notice a pattern with your menstrual cycle? Diabetics often do. Interesting, I actually did not. I think I was in my ovulatory phase of the cycle when this monitor was on and then I went into my luteal phase, I don't think I noticed anything, but I also wasn't looking out for it, so maybe next time I will. What is your target range? I think, I mean, my target range was like 70 to 120, but I wanted my blood sugar to be under 100 first thing in the morning, and then sometimes it would spike to like the 150 or 160 after a meal, and I would try to get it back down below 120 for the day. What do you do with these numbers if not using insulin? Good question. If you are not diabetic and you don't need extra insulin, then really what you can do when you see a high number is try to do either some physical activity or try to eat something else that balances blood sugar. That's as far as I understand. You know, when you pair certain foods together or when you pair certain foods with exercise, your blood sugar can be balanced naturally if you don't have diabetes and if your body can create enough insulin. I hope this answered all of your questions about the monitor. I feel like it was a pretty eye-opening experience for me and I learned a lot. You know, I still have a lot of questions about diabetes. I still don't really understand my pre-diabetes situation. I still don't really know if that means like pre-type 1, pre-type 2. I don't know what is going on, but I'm just keeping you guys in the loop with this monitor and it is something I would definitely do again in my life. I would recommend it to anyone who's curious about it. Thank you for coming to my channel. Thanks for asking the questions. Let me know if you have any more questions below and I'm here to answer them. Bye.